Hello, my name is Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. August is Women in Translation Month, a month designed to make you read more books that have been written by women and translated, often translated by women as well is what we're going for. This is because 80% of the books that are translated into English every year are by men, or at least that, I'm not sure what year that statistic is from, um, but something like that, which means that women from other cultures are less being translated into English, and so we're trying to encourage the reading of more of them. So in this video, I'm going to talk to you about nine of my favourite books that have been translated by women and written by women in the original language as well. I only have nine, I aimed for ten, which is what I normally do in videos like this, but I could only get to nine that I had actually loved out of the ones that I had read, um, which just means that I need to do some more reading. Um, but I have found recently that a lot of the books that I love are women in translation books, and I have recently got into this sort of weird subgenre of um, unsettling dark books by women about women that are quite short and have no plot, um, and I made a TBR of books that I want to read in that genre, which I'll leave linked in the cards above, and there are lots of women in translation recommendations in there as well. So the first book on my list is one that I know a lot of people love, and it is The Vegetarian by Han Kang, which was translated by Deborah Smith. And this is uh, from South Korea, um, and it is about a woman who one day has a dream, uh, a really brutal, violent dream, and decides to give up meat. Um, but it's kind of more about her rejection of society and descent into mental ill health. Um, and we only see her from the perspective of different people in her life um, throughout the course of the book. We never see anything from her own perspective. Um, and we see her from the perspective of her husband, her brother-in-law, and then her sister. And as she slowly stops eating meat and then kind of stops eating altogether, um, and the way that these people want to take from her um, and they want to exploit her um, and view her more for their own gain than for themselves, for her as a person herself. Um, and this is through like a controlling relationship and through art. Um, and so we see the treatment of mental health in Korea and also it's a lot about women's position in Korea. This is a book that it took me a while to get into despite it being so short because the first perspective is from her husband and he is a terrible person. And I can enjoy books with terrible people, but I didn't know whether the writing style then, I didn't really know at the beginning, that the issues I was having with the writing style were purely because it was from this man's perspective. Because the writing style does change when you go through each of the different um, characters. And it gets slowly more and more unhinged and more um, <laughs> kind of unsettling and weird things happen. Um, and it makes you feel very kind of uncomfortable. But I really enjoyed that about this book. I thought that it was so engrossing once I got over the terrible character in the beginning. It became so page turning and compelling and um, a really gripping read, which is not something that I normally find with literary fiction. It's not something that I find myself unable to stop reading, but that's what this book felt like for me. It felt so unsettled and like I guess how some people feel reading horror books. Um, I guess in some ways you could consider this to be horror but it's not like super out there um, in terms of the brutality of the things described. Um, it's just quite weird and a little disgusting, a little gross. Um, but I enjoyed that very much. I thought it was really powerful and wonderfully done. The next book on my list is even weirder and darker. I would say, well, it's definitely darker um, and more unsettling, but I don't know, it doesn't quite go as weird, I don't think. And this this is The Discomfort of Evening, and I apologise for my butchery of the Dutch names, um, but it's Marieke Lucas Reineveld, and it was translated by Michelle Hutchison. This is a very dark coming-of-age novel about a young girl whose brother died in an ice skating accident, and she lives in this rural Christian community, which is very strict, has very, like, closed rules, and it's a closed Kind of culture where pe they don't really interact with people outside of their own church group very much. Um, and it is her, her dealing with her grief and her coming of age, as I said, and her feeling very disconnected and separated from the other people in her church and her um, feelings of loss of belief in things, um, and her also feelings of guilt um, at the loss of her brother. Um, trigger warnings in here of, of like animal abuse and sexual abuse, um, paedophilia, lots of very dark things happen and it goes in very dark um, places. But what I really enjoyed about it, enjoyed feels like the wrong word, what I really admired about it was the uh, way that the writer, we felt, it felt so honest and vulnerable 
but it never really felt like it went over the top. Um, it felt like I could understand where she, how she kept going further and further into this dark, strange place. Um, I felt like she felt a, like a really well fleshed out character, and it also never felt particularly um, sensationalist. It felt like it was exploring these weird themes and these dark events without being um, purient, um, and I really enjoyed that. I thought that it. Um, it was again another really compelling book that I found it difficult to stop reading. It was very shocking. It was very. Um, I had a strong emotional reaction to it, um, but it didn't feel like it was. I guess it was intending to inflict those things from me, but it didn't ever feel dishonest in the way that it was doing that. I think sometimes dark books can feel um, like you can notice the author um, and the way that they're writing. I did say that this book. This is. Um, this video is about women in translation and Marieke is actually non-binary um, but it is translated by a woman and I think being of a minority gender does also fit within the spirit of Women in Translation Month. Now when I was reading books by Spanish-speaking South American writers, um, a vlog of which I will leave in the cards above, I came across Mariana Enrique's collection of short stories Things We Have Lost in the Fire which was translated from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. Uh, this is a collection of, again, weird, dark, slightly unhinged stories. Um, as I said, that is a genre I am getting into at the moment. And this is about contemporary Argentina and Buenos Aires and the scars and ghosts left by the dictatorship um, and the way that those still uh, seep out into everyday life. In some stories there is the literal haunting of a um, motel by the events of the dictatorship. Uh, these stories do skew into the ghostly, I would say. Um, I read an article, if I can find it, I will leave it in the cards above, about um, magical realism and the uh, surreal and um, dark absurdity that has come more into more contemporary Latin American fiction, like it's gone beyond magical realism and into the speculative surreal, the like horror end of the genre um, and I really really enjoyed it. It, Each of these stories does get quite, there is something very dark and unsettling about all of them, um, there is constantly a feeling of like being watched and of um, something coming for you <laughs> um, or for the character in the book, um, a bit real feeling of tension that I think is skillfully done in a short story because there's not enough space, there's not as much space to bring out the tension um, and I really enjoyed the writing style um, and the translation, I thought that they were very skillfully done um, and yeah I've, I've really got into this kind of short story as well, I think it really works in a form of short story and I definitely want to read more of Mariana Enriquez's work. Next on my list is Cartelin Street by Magda Szabo, which is translated from the Hungarian by Len Rix. And this was one that I read for Women in Translation Month last year. This is set in Hungary between two time periods, so it's set during the Second World War and also during the Soviet occupation of Hungary. I think we're in like the 1960s, 1970s perhaps, in that second time period. Um, and it is about three families who lived next door to one another um, before the um, German invasion of Hungary in the Second World War and um, their relationships with one another. One is in the army, um, one is one of the fathers is in the army and it's about the th four children interactions with one another and then we are also set in the future where two of these children have got married um, and we see the fallout of the events that happened during the Second World War. One of these families is a Jewish family um, and this the girl from the child girl from the the Jewish family is haunting the families in the later um, in the later time period. Um, that happens right at the beginning. We are told from the perspective of this young girl who has been haunting them for um, years now, and, and it's a very kind of small story about people under. Um, under surveillance. I think surveillance is a really big theme here and they're being surveilled both by the ghost that is haunting them and by the um, states that are involved, the Nazis and the Soviet Union. Um, and there is a lot of like rep reporting on one another, being part of the story, following one another, all of these families they are constantly watching each other. It's a very slow moving book um, where it feels like lo not much is happening and then all of a sudden we get dragged into a plot that is inevitable. Like you know what's going to happen purely from there being a Jewish family in a novel set during the Second World War. You're like, you know where that's going. But it kind of doesn't focus on that. That's like that event is not the core of the book at all. And so we, we see the, the the relationships between the families and the and the fallout of a decision that changed everything. Um and 
then also we see how um, the similarities between when it was Nazi occupied and when it was Soviet occupied, the, the um, constant attention being paid during the Soviet um, Union's period. And it's a really beautiful and melancholy book. And I, again, want to read more of Magda Sabo's work because I know a lot of people have raved about The Door, um, which I haven't read. Next, a piece of historical fiction, and that is Segu by Maurice Condé, uh, which was translated from the French by Barbara Bray. Maurice Condé is a Guadeloupian author, but this book is set in um, early modern Mali. Um, well, it is now Mali, but at the time it was the Kingdom of Segu, and it is about four sons of one of the important men from this Kingdom of Segu, um, and the, the different paths that their lives take after um, colonialism from both starts with Arabic colo colonialism and then um, Western British colonialism. I think, no, it's French, isn't it? Are they British or are they French? They end up in Port Brazil at one point. So Portuguese, British and French colonists are all involved um, with the interaction. Uh, the book, in fact, starts with a white man coming to the Kingdom of Segu and them all being freaked out about it because they're like, what is that? Um, and it is a really interesting book, one that follows um, multiple different characters in the ways that colonialism affected African nations or um, during the time. So one of the boys um, translate, uh, one of the boys uh, converts to Islam and ends up in North Africa. I can't remember whether it's Morocco or Algeria, but he ends up in North Africa and then comes back. Um, there is one boy who gets to Christianity and ends up in the UK. One boy who is captured by slavers and ends up in Portugal, in Brazil. And one boy who stays in the village. We see the complex machinations of the um, kind of court of Segu um, and also just the, the various different insidious ways that colonial colonialism affected um, the culture and then the people as well. Um, it's a, a long novel, a really like epic kind of full sweep. Like I think I've not read Homegoing by Yara Jassy but I think if you like that you would like this because it doesn't jump through multiple different generations in that way although we do um, proceed to the children of some of these boys as well um, but it just spans such a broad space um, both in terms of uh, time and also geographically so like as I said one of the boys the younger boy is only born at the very beginning of the novel um, and whereas the oldest boy is going through his like rite of passage to be a man and so we see colonialism over a great big period of time in West Africa um, as well as how different how far flung people became and none of these boys are particularly good or likable characters um and i think that it is interesting that it is exploring the culture in that way like it's not saying like this was a haven and then colonialism happened um it talks about it's honest about the culture at the time and also the brutalities of colonialism and how it doesn't really matter <laughs> like what the culture was like that doesn't mean it was right um so yeah there is some really violent stuff that happens to women particularly in this book um so i would keep an eye out for that and um women characters aren't particularly well developed either i would say but i feel like it's a there's a point a point is being made there because we're from the perspective of these men um and so it's making a point about culture um and i really enjoyed it i thought it was uh, a really interesting and engrossing read now that was the only long book on this list i think everything else is quite short including Rue by Kim Thuay, which was translated again from French by Sheila Fishman. And this is a semi-autobiographical novel told in vignettes. Um, and it is about the Vietnamese boat people, as they were known, um, Kim Thuay's experience, leaving Vietnam during the Vietnam War, ending up in a um, refugee camp in Thailand and eventually uh, traveling to um, Canada and in, uh, growing up in Canada and what the interaction with that Canadian culture was like um, as a Vietnamese person. And it is told, as I said, in these vignettes, and they are some of the most beautifully written things that I have read. They are so like stunningly distilled down to this small period, the feeling of when she first steps off the plane into this snowy landscape or um, of her, her um, aunt who had a learning disability and how she was treated in Vietnam. Um, it was very shocking and difficult to read. Um, but also like the, the what it was like to be going through the Vietnamese war as Vietnamese people um, in from the south um, who really distilled down to these very small per periods and they are told in a very choppy way like it's not linear in any way these vignettes just come from different periods and it feels like her just 
building slowly building upon this feeling and this life um really difficult to read about uh the thai refugee camps as well and her experience there that was a, a very powerfully and moving thing i think it's a very emotive book um and a book that really touches you um but it's written in this kind of crystalline distilled kind of way um that it's very like matter of fact about these difficult time periods that feels um i think even more powerful because of that and i read that when i was reading books for the readathon in 2020 um so i'll leave that vlog linked in the cards above if you'd like to see my more immediate reactions next one that i read a while ago again and that is kim ji Yong, born 1982 by cho lam ju which was translated from the korean by jamie chang and so we start off with this woman and she has a mental breakdown and then we go back in time and we see her life um, in South Korea from 1982 up until the point where she has this mental breakdown um, just living as a woman in Korea and it is really a difficult read um, it's written in a very detached style that um, I think some people have found difficult to get on with um, because it's it is written in this really distanced kind of clinical language um, and it also has footnotes which is really interesting footnotes to um, actual studies when something happens to Kim Ji-yong um, it will link to a study that talks about how prevalent this is for women in South Korea. Um, so there's her experience of when she's growing up, her um, her mother and her grandmother treating her as less than her brother and um, the, the, having to do worse in tests so that the boys could do better when she was at school and um, things like her, her experience of getting a job um, and her experience of uh, cameras in bathrooms and... Um, of when she became pregnant how her job treated her after that as well um, and so it's just about everyday sexism in Korea which is really applicable to other countries as well although I would say it does seem like more socially acceptable and uh, not legally protected in the same way as it is in this country uh, at least but it, it, it did feel really sort of stark and really made everything come together may kind of explained the reason for this detachment and it felt really well done I really enjoyed it so um, I would say if you are not necessarily someone who enjoys a detached writing style if you persevere through this book and it is a very short book um, you will be rewarded in the end and it kind of like opened my eyes like up until the ending I thought it was just a three star book but the ending really put it over the top for me and I really really enjoyed it so yeah I would definitely read that one and then finally we have a collection of poetry which is Negatives of a Group Photograph by Azita Hareman, translated by Eloman Shakifa and Maura Dooley. And so this is a collection of poetry and they had a translator who was doing the translation into English and then Maura Dooley who is a poet to make them into a more poetic form. And Maura Dooley, fun fact, was my tutor when I did my masters in uh, creative and life writing. Uh, so she helped me with my poetry. Um, so that was one of the reasons I ended up, I decided to read this book and I'm really glad I did. So it's been translated from Farsi um, or Persian I think. Um, and what was really interesting about this book was that the way that they did this collaboratively. So it was, as I said, we had, they had a translator and a poet and they were talking about the meanings of different words in different languages um, and the way that things don't directly translate and how difficult that is for poetry. So, I mean, I would honestly read this book for the um, introduction alone, never mind the fact that I thought the poetry was really beautiful as well. Uh, but yeah the poetry itself has some really beautiful turns of phrase really beautiful uses of rhythm and rhyme um it's a book that i like highlighted and bookmark loads of because it just had such beautiful lines in it i do find it quite difficult to describe poetry um to recommend but i would say that this one if you like poetry that has um really beautiful imagery but isn't too opaque or confusing which is sometimes what i find with poetry collections they can be too far too esoteric or too simple. Um, this one falls in my personal definition of the right level of poetic um, and it explores ideas of love and family and connection um, or ideas which I love reading about in poetry. So there you have it there are nine books my women that have been translated that I have loved. I'm hoping to read more um, and ever be expanding on this list uh, so do let me know in the comments down below if there are any you um, have read and loved yourself I would love to hear from you. If you like this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you did, there will be a couple of videos here that I think you will like, like that one on weird women and maybe another one as well. And if you did enjoy it, um, please do subscribe if you haven't already. I try to make videos twice a week and so I will see you again very soon. Thank you for watching.
Bye-bye.